We are in just a few moments. We're going to have the Lord's Supper, or you may notice communion together. We're going to serve, uh, each of us are going to be served a little piece of bread, a little cracker, all right? And we're all going to get a little cup of juice, and we're going to eat it, and we're going to drink it together. And it could be, that could be all there is to it for you if you don't think about it, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about it for just a second so it means something to us. Now, the meal that we're going to celebrate is a traditional uh, meal going back thousands and thousands of years. You like traditional meals? You know, maybe you got a special Easter something you're going to have with your family, get together after church and have a special Easter meal. I, you know, I love at Thanksgiving that we have, you know, dressing and cranberry sauce mixed all together. It's so good. Don't eat it any other time of the year except Thanksgiving. I think I need to have it you know, a couple times a week, I think, but I only get it at Thanksgiving. It, it makes it all the more special, right? It's a, it's a special time, Christmas traditions, all those things. We, we, uh, we have those things and, and we sit around, we remember the Thanksgiving's past and maybe we remember people who've gone on from here. Maybe we're eating grandma's dressing recipe or, or something uh, like that. Her dishes we pull out at Christmas and use and we remember things in the past, traditions from the past. Those traditions are good because they help us to remember. The, um, the meal that God gave to his people originally was called the Passover meal. And Jesus changed the name of it. Um, he changed the, the meanings a little bit. But the meal goes all the way back to when God brought his children out of slavery in Egypt. His people had grown uh, to a large group of people and were very successful in Egypt. Um, and God was going to bring them out and bring them to the promised land. But the pharaohs, the kings of Egypt, got so scared of God's people because they were growing so large. They thought maybe if there's an uprising, uh, we will be defeated. They'll take over. And so they enslaved them. They put them all into bondage and actually were so worried about their numbers growing that they started killing their male children. The soldiers would go through and kill the male babies of the uh, Israelites. And God hears the cry of his people, he tells Moses. I've heard my people crying out. I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh's heart is hard and he won't let the people go and God sends plagues into Egypt and finally the last plague that comes is called the plague of the firstborn and God tells Moses to go and tell Pharaoh that, that all, of, all of the firstborn of Egypt are going to die on this one night so like if you're the firstborn in your family alright you're gone okay alright and so but he tells his people he tells his children the Israelites so I want you to have a special meal this night on this night, I want you to take a spotless male lamb, perfect little lamb, and I want you to prepare it as your dinner. All right? Now, it's not like you go to the grocery store and you get your lamb shrink wrap, you know, on a little tray. They have to prepare their lamb, so they have to slaughter their lamb. And he says, when you, when you do that, when you prepare the lamb, take some of the blood from the lamb, I want you to put it over your doorposts. You put it over your doorposts. And on that night... When the angel of death comes through Egypt and he sees that blood on your doorpost, it will pass over your house. Your firstborn will be spared. There's other parts of that meal. They would have unleavened bread, you know, like pita bread, something like that with no yeast in it. All right? And they were supposed to eat the meal with their staff in their hand and with their robe tucked into their belt. And that just meant they were ready to go. So robe tucked into your belt. It's like you pull it up and tuck it in so you could run. All right? They're supposed to be ready to go because God's going to free them. God's going to deliver them from bondage. Now, when Jesus comes, the last meal that he has with his disciples, his 12 guys, the last meal that he shares with them is that Passover meal. It's that time of year. And so they're there and they're, they're eating the meal. And he takes the bread there and he breaks it and he says, he says, this now is my body. So he wants them to remember. When they eat the bread, they're to think of his body. Now what's he talking about? He gives his body on the cross as a sacrifice. He is the lamb that was slain. All right? It's his blood that's going to cover us and spare us. Right? It's his blood that gives us grace and gives us ultimately freedom. 
And so when he takes that cup of wine, he, he, says, he says, this is my blood. This is my blood. It's poured out for the forgiveness of sins. He changes the meaning of this meal and he tells them, when you do this, when you do this, remember me. Remember me. <laughs> I've gone on these uh, Emmaus retreats and the way we serve communion, the pastors stand up front and everybody comes uh, to them and, uh, and you, you put the, the bread in their hand or you give them the juice and um, we're going to do it differently this morning. We're going to pass it out. But, but I'd stand there and, and everybody would come up and they'd hold their hands out like this and you'd put the bread in their hand. You'd say, the body of Christ given for you. Or you the, hold out the cup. The blood of Christ given for you. And this one guy I always come through the line. It was on several of these retreats with this guy. And every time he'd come up, he'd come up with his hands out and say, the body of Christ given for you. And he'd go, I remember. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Say, I remember. I thought that was so beautiful. It was so good, right? Um, and so this morning, the reason that we have this meal together as a family, it's our tradition, is so that we will remember. We will remember that something real happened for us. As real as you chewing this little cracker and the and this juice going down your throat, as real as that is, something real happened for you. You really needed a Savior. And Jesus really died for you. He's not just some good example. He's not just some teacher to follow. He's a Savior. He's a sacrifice. And so as we eat this meal together, we will remember today. So let's have our servers come forward. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass out uh, the bread and the juice to you. And I want you just to hold on to it. And, and just hold on to it for a second. And when everybody's served, then we're all going to eat together as a family. All right? So let's, uh, you just uh, hold tight as we serve. Paul, explaining the Lord's Supper to the church of Corinth, he writes these words in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord took Jesus, took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this, remember, do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Father God, we thank you that as a church family we can remember today. God, we thank you for this bread and for this cup. And God, we pray that as we eat and drink that we would remember the sacrifice of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Take, eat, and drink. Father, thank you. Thank you for salvation and hope that comes in Jesus. Amen. When he stepped out from that meal, when he left out, he and his disciples, Jesus went to a garden. Actually, it's an olive grove, like an olive farm, called the Garden of Gethsemane. And he went there, and his, his heart was very heavy. In Matthew 26, it says this. It says, Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. And he took Peter, Zebedee's two sons, James and John. And it says this. He became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. I... I have a hard time even imagining this scene. And here Jesus is, he's just had this meal with his disciples. And he's, he's done something at this meal that was way out of character for a teacher and, and his followers, his students. During that meal, um, Jesus got up from the table and he took off his, his outer robe and he got down uh, on his hands and knees and he washed his disciples' feet. 
is way, way out of line for, for what should be happening. He's the rabbi. He's the teacher. He's the one that they've given their life to follow him, right? There to serve him. But he gets down and he washes their feet. It's, it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a service that is so humbling. It takes, really, it takes courage to step out and to do something so out of the ordinary. But Jesus knows who he is. He's very secure in who he is. And he does this amazing thing. It's this courage to serve. Um, it's something for us to be reminded of that we, we have opportunities to serve all the time in our families, to serve your wife, to serve your husband, to serve your children. Um, we don't, many times we don't take them seriously enough. We're not, we're not courageous to do the things that we need to do, to walk away from, from some things that, that would keep us from serving them like they should or, or not stepping up and being the man or the woman that we should be, not saying the hard thing that needs to be said, to serve them like we should not being courageous to, to show some, some weakness, to get down on our hands and knees to serve. We um, need people to be courageous to serve and families, so families can, can stay strong, can survive. It's the same here in the church. I need people to be courageous to serve in the church, to serve the gospel of Jesus Christ through the church so that we can be strong and survive. Next week, um, we're going to be at the Central Activity Center for Easter services. We're going to have same service times, 10, 11, 30. And part of what I want you to do this week to be courageous, I want you to be courageous to, to serve the Lord by inviting other people to come. That may not be your thing, inviting somebody else to church. You know, uh, listen, if that's, if that's a stretch for you, I want to challenge you to be courageous this week because our hope and our prayer is not just to serve our folks as we all come together. Uh, our hope and our prayer is that we serve our community. We're inviting people in the community. We sent home 700 notices from the school, you know, to let the people in our community know that we want to serve them. And so we're going we're gonna to tell them about the hope that is in Jesus. But we need you also to be inviting your friends and your family, right? There's going to be a moment, or a day, Easter day, where, where most people, if you ask them, they would say, yeah, I'll go to church on Easter. I won't go to church any other time. I'll go on Easter. But you be courageous and you ask them, use the stuff that's on the Facebook and the Instagram and share it with people or whatever, but, but you be courageous and ask somebody. Um, Jesus goes out there and, and he's there in the garden and he says, he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. What is, what's going on here? This is Jesus, right? This is guy who not worried about even what his disciples thought. He got down, he humbled himself, he, he stood up in the temple and he, and he beat out the money changer. He, he chased him out, you know, and, and he's courageous. He's courageous, Jesus. And now he's saying, my soul is crushed. I'm, I'm, I'm at the point of, of death, you know. Um, Father, if it's possible to take this cup of suffering from me, what is this cup of suffering? Well, he's, he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming. He's tried to help his disciples understand, but he knows. He knows the cross is before him. It's not just the cross. It's that his disciples are going to run, that Peter's going to deny him, that people are going to tell lies about him. He's going to be mocked and scorned, beaten, hung, to, hung on a cross, and he's going to die. All that is enough to make me be anguished to the point of death. But it's even more that Jesus knows is coming. Because there on the cross, it's not just the pain of nails that he feels. But there on the cross, he has the weight of all the sin of the world on him. 
So that's what he comes to do. He comes to save us from our sin. He takes the sin, the guilt, the shame, the pain, the hurt, all of it, all the betrayal, all the lies that you have committed and all that have been committed against you, all of it on him in that moment on the cross. And he cries out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, all of the sin of the world is poured out on him. The weight of all of it is on him and his father steps back. They've been together for all time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he takes this mission. He takes this mission to bear the sin of the world. And in that moment, there's a break. The Bible says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. He takes all of it on himself. The other part of that is, though, we get his righteousness. Because he never, because he never failed, because he walked through this moment, because he said, not my will, God, but your will, because he was courageous and hopeful in that moment, because he also knew what was on the other side of that cross, that as painful and as hard as this was going to be, Sunday was coming. As difficult, as much suffering as he was going to bear, God was going to raise him up. Jesus had hope, and it made him courageous. But he prayed again. He said, he said, my father, it's possible. Let this cup suffering be taken from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And so he, he gets up from praying and he goes over to his disciples and he finds them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch for me even for one hour? Couldn't you watch my back? Couldn't you be with me? Stay up with me? Pray with me? Just for an hour. You see see where I am you see how much I'm hurting you see he says keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing but the body is weak don't I know it don't I know that my spirit I think is willing I had great intentions for the Lord and for what I'm going to do and for what I'm not going to do and, and how righteous and holy I'm going to be. And my, my flesh fails me over and over and over again. And you know what? That's why Jesus is going to the cross. Because our flesh is weak. We cannot do it on our own. He looks at his disciples that he loves and he sees them failing even in this most crucial of moments. He sees them failing and falling down and he says, the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. They need a savior. They need someone to stand up for them, to go for them, to be, uh, to be a sacrifice. And so he goes back and he prays again. He says a uh, second time, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. And we returned to them again. He found them sleeping for they couldn't even open their eyes. They couldn't keep their eyes open. And so he just went and he prayed a third time saying the same things. We've been talking about hope. You see in Jesus in this moment where he says, not my will, but your will, Father. He knows what's coming. He knows the suffering that's coming. But his hope in, is what is on the other side of that. Now, you may be suffering this morning. You may be, you may be right down in it this morning. You may be ready to give up. You may be ready to give up on your marriage. You may be ready to give up on school. You may be ready to just give up because... It's just too hard. And you don't see, you don't see the other side of it. But you know, you can hear God telling you, you, you know from his word or just what you've heard from, from other people speaking into your life or the Holy Spirit speaking into you. You know that there's, there are things that you need to do. You need to be courageous and you need to get up and you need to keep going. You don't need to give up right? There's something that you need to do to fix your marriage. Maybe it's to be courageous and say you're sorry. 
and you just can't stand the thought of taking the blame, right? Of taking the guilt, of taking the shame, of saying, all right, I'll take the blame here. I'll, I'll lose this one. But you just can't bear the thought. It would be too much. It makes your stomach hurt to think about saying you're sorry. I tell you, because of the hope that you have in Jesus, because you know that on that cross, he took your shame, he took your blame, he took your guilt and he carried it all, that you can have hope that whatever God's asking you to do, if it's go ask for forgiveness, to go to say you're sorry, whatever it is, it's gonna be better on the other side of that. On the other side of that difficult moment, on the other side of saying no to the drugs, of saying no to the alcohol, of saying yes to the things that you need to be doing, saying yes to church, saying yes to being in, in the word, to saying, saying yes, Jesus, I'll just follow you. I need forgiveness. Maybe for the first time today, that's you. You've never given your life to him. Maybe that's you today. You just need to submit and say yes to him. And it's going to be hard because you're going to see, you're going to see, I'm, my sin has taken over my life. And there's going to be things that are going to change. It's going to be different. And I don't know if I've got the courage to do it. And you know what? You know what? You can't do it on your own. So you have to have your hope in him. And that's going to give you courage to step up, to step out, to say no, to say yes, whatever it is. Or maybe it's just to hang on a little longer. Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but your will. He came to his disciples and said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But look, this is the time, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. He doesn't get up and run. The soldiers are coming. Judas is there to show him where he was, where he was there praying, praying for all of them, right? Praying through this moment. And Judas, the betrayer, comes in. He brings the soldiers, and they come to arrest Jesus. And Jesus says, get up, look, there they are. And he doesn't run. He goes right to them. Courageous, goes right to him. Why? Because he knows his father is going to take care of him in the end. He knows he's going to raise him up. He knows that Sunday's coming. But you know what? He did it. He did it for you. He did it for us. Who do you need to be courageous for? You need to be courageous for the glory of God, like Garrett said? Absolutely. But there's people in your life you need to be courageous for. You need to be courageous for your children. You need to be courageous for your spouse, for your neighbor. There's somebody in your world that needs to hear the name Jesus that may never come into this building, that may not come to an Easter service, but they need to hear that Jesus offers them hope and you may be the one who needs to tell them. Amen. And you can invite people to church all day long and the conversation never gets weird, but when you say Jesus, it immediately gets weird. All right, because you talk about this guy who died for them, a guy who dies for you, he can make any claim on your life, right? If he gives his life for you, he's calling you to give your life to him, that means he can call you to do anything. And so it gets weird then, doesn't it? But maybe you need to be courageous to say, friend, family member, your life is broken, you're hurting, your only hope, your only help is Jesus, is Jesus. And that may take courage for you to do it. It takes courage for, listen, I, I'm a pastor and I gotta ask God to give me courage because it gets weird. It gets this confrontation, it suddenly gets serious. But there's people out there that need you to be courageous for them. And so, because of what Jesus did, not because of our power and not because our our strength is, is going to, you know, not because we're going to work up our strength to do what's right. We're going to be courageous because we're hopeful, not in our strength, but what he has done. We're going to be hopeful in what's coming after the cross. There's an there's a old uh, part of a sermon that an uh, old preacher um, did years ago, and, and other preachers have tried to copy it over the years. It's, it's really cool. It talks about it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You may have heard it. It's really, really neat. 
Um, and I, I thought about maybe me trying to share it with you, but I, 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 there's no way I could do it justice. And so I'm, I'm going to have somebody else uh, help me with it this morning so that we remember that no matter what suffering is now, no matter what difficulty, we've got to be courageous and step through. Whatever it is, it's just what's happening right now. It's just what we see right now. There's something better coming. It's Friday. Everything looks dark. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday, but let me tell you something, Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming, it's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Amen. You believe it? You believe Sunday's coming? Today's a heavy day as we think about the cross. We think about Jesus in the garden. It's a heavy day. Maybe a heavy time in your life right now. Um, but Sunday is coming. And you know what? We know it already has come. Jesus is already raised from the dead. He proved his power even over death. So there's nothing in our life, nothing in your life that he does not have power over. And so my call to you this morning is will you just give it to him? You give in to your, your fear 
I mean, give, just give away your fear, give away your anxiety, give away all of that and just be courageous to live for Jesus. You have every reason in the world to be hopeful. And because you have reason to be hopeful, you have reason to be courageous and to do what God is calling you to do. Let's pray. Father.